Prabha, Digital India, Educated India. Hello students, welcome to today's lecture. In last several lectures, we have discussed the quantum mechanical solutions of different systems. The systems that we have taken in this course so far, for example, the particle in a box or harmonic oscillator or even the most complex one being the hydrogen atom, all these problems could be solved quantum mechanically and we could find their exact solution. However, today in in today's class we will see that when we have any system which is more complex than hydrogen atom, for example in particular when we have more than one electron in, in our system, in that case we will not be able to solve the Schrodinger equation exactly and in such a case as you know that in, in chemistry we deal with heavy elements also with molecules which have certainly more than one electrons. So, in such cases, in those cases, how can we solve this problem quantum mechanically? The answer to this question lies in what are the known as some approximate methods in quantum mechanics. From now onwards, we will spend some lectures in discussing different approximate methods and how we can use them to uh, solve some quantum mechanical problems of, of our interest. In today's class, uh, before we look for uh, any particular uh, quantum mechanical met, uh, uh, met, uh, quantum mechanical model for which we would look solution, let us first recall what we discussed in an earlier class. For example, we wrote down the molecular Hamiltonian. So, in a molecule we have several nuclei and each atom in the molecule also brings electrons. So, therefore, we have several nuclei and several electrons. So, when I write down the Hamiltonian of this molecule, of course, I know that Hamiltonian is the energy operator. So, I in this operator, I must keep all those energy terms that can come out of this molecular system. For example, each nucleus in the molecule will contribute to one nuclear kinetic energy operator, each electron will contribute to one electron kinetic energy operator and electrons and nuclei will have attractive interaction between them plus electron electron repulsion and finally, the nuclear nuclear repulsion. So, you can see the Hamiltonian that we have written down here contains all these terms. Uh, one thing that you might have already noticed is that this Hamiltonian is written in the so called at atomic unit. In atomic unit, we have made some, uh, cons uh, some constants as, as 1. For example, the unit of mass is given by electron mass in atomic unit. So, the value of mass of electron is 1 atomic unit whose SI value is 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kilogram. Similarly, the charge of electron is considered as 1 unit of charge in atomic unit. So, therefore, wherever we had E square term the cool in the Coulomb interaction term wherever we had E square term in such cases when I am writing down the Hamiltonian in atomic unit those E square term are not present here because they are all equal to 1. Similarly, here the mass of electron uh, which should have been there in the kinetic energy operator of the electron. So, there the mass of electron has been made 1. So, therefore, we do not see. Then you the vacuum permittivity 4 pi epsilon 0 that this term also appears in all Coulomb interactions. So, you would see that all cases where 4 pi epsilon 0 for example, here or here which is electron electron repulsion or nuclear nuclear repulsion in all these cases 4 pi epsilon 0 has been made 1. So, this and also h bar which should have been there in the kinetic energy of the nucleus kinetic energy of the electron also has been made 1. So, use of atomic unit makes our molecular Hamiltonian rather simple. So, from now onwards we would stick to uh, writing down the Hamiltonian in atomic units for simplicity. There are some other things that we should discuss in the atomic unit. For example, the unit of energy in atomic unit is given by Hartree and it is written as E with a subscript of H. So, this is one Hartree which is equivalent to uh, this number given here. In fact, you would find uh, you would say that this one Hartree would be equal to 27.2 electron volt which is twice the energy of hydrogen atom in its ground state. So, therefore, the hydrogen atom's ground state energy is half 
of atomic unit with a negative sign showing the stability of the uh, atom. So, the other thing that you should uh, pay attention to is that the time, the atomic unit of time is given as in, in the unit of uh, 2.4 into 10 to the power minus 17 second or you can express it as 0 0.24 atto second, atto second is 10 to the power minus second. So, atto second is the time scale through which the electrons move around the uh, nuclear environment. So, that is that there is something called atto second spectroscopy using which we can uh, monitor the electronic uh, states. Uh, Bohr's radius is the unit of length in atomic unit. So, this we have made 1 which is equivalent to 0 0.53 angstrom. Uh, uh, if you see the Bohr magneton that we discussed while discussing the Z man effect, you see that it is we, uh, we expressed it as E h bar 2 twice divided by twice m e. So, you see E is 1 in atomic unit, h bar is 1 in atomic unit, mass of electron is 1 in atomic unit. So, therefore, mu b or the Bohr magneton simply became half. So, you see that by using atomic units, we can simplify our uh, uh, description of the Hamiltonian uh, quite a bit. Now, we come back to the, uh, the Hamiltonian that we have. You see the terms that we have here, for example, this is the uh, first term, the kinetic energy of the nucleus. These terms, this is, these are the kinetic energy of electrons. This is potential energy of between electron and nucleus, this is potential energy between electrons electrons and this is potential energy between nucleus and nucleus. Now, uh, look at the situ uh, case. So, these are all one electron operators, these are all one electron operators, here these are two electron operator, these terms are independent of electrons also this term because this is nuclear kinetic energy and this is nuclear nuclear repulsion energy. We discussed already in, in an earlier class regarding von Oppenheimer approximation which suggests that since the nuclei are much heavier than uh, the electrons. So, when we are solving the electronic problem, the we can assume that the nuclear nuclei are frozen. So, nuclei do not change their time, we allow the uh, we look for the solution of the electronic part of the problem and then we change the nuclear environment and then again we solve this. Uh, this is an outcome of Born Oppenheimer approximation. So, in that case what we do if we invoke a Born Oppenheimer approximation, the kinetic energy of nuclei become 0 and the this term the potential energy uh, uh, between nuclear uh, nucleus and another nucleus becomes a constant. Why? Because we are telling that the nuclei are frozen while we are solving the electronic part of the problem. So, this is a constant, this is 0 and then we are left with uh, these terms uh, the one electron term and the two electronic terms and we call this as the electronic Hamiltonian. So, this electronic Hamiltonian is it, it, it depends of course, explicitly on the electronic coordinates given by small r, but it also has a parametric dependence on nuclear coordinate capital R. So, this has this means this has explicit dependence and this has parametric dependence. What do I mean by parametric dependence? We say that we have defined this electronic Hamiltonian for a particular nuclear configuration. For example, consider uh, a simple molecule water. So, we have some distance r 1, uh, I call it r 2, uh, I call this angle theta. So, where all the coordinates I am, uh, I am able to uh, change. So, for a given configuration value of r 1, r 2, theta, the nuclei are frozen, they are fixed in their place while they are fixed in their place. So, you would see that the kinetic energy of the nuclei becomes 0 because I have frozen them and the nuclear nuclear repulsion because they simply depend on the charge of the nuclei and the relative distance between them. Since, I have frozen this 
three nuclei so they therefore this becomes a constant so we can simply add them later what it has explicit dependence is on the electronic coordinates because the electrons are all over the place and then we are trying to find the electronic part of the solution. But this solution that we will get the electronic part of the solution that we would get is applicable only for a fixed value of r1, r2 or theta or for a fixed nuclear geometry. So, now if I solve this part of the uh, problem I call this So, this is my solution of the electronic Hamiltonian. So, where the psi electronic is the eigenfunction corresponding to H electronic and E electronic is the corresponding energy levels in, in energy value. Now, I have this equation for a fixed value of R or the for a fixed nuclear uh, configuration. Now, if I change this nuclear configuration from R to let us say R prime, I would my solution would also change. So, I would get a different value of wave function, I will get a different value of energy. So, in, in other words if I change my r, if I change my r which is actually the nuclear configuration and look for this electronic energy for different values of r and I would get for example, if I start with 1 r I got this energy, I took another configuration I got another energy, I got another configuration I took energy and so on and so forth. So, I am getting different discrete energies why because at each value of r I am solving this electronic part of the solution uh, electric, electronic part of the problem. Now, when I connect them what I get is called known as the potential energy curve. This potential energy curve is obtained by solving the electronic part of the problem at many times each time with a different nuclear configuration by changing this bond length r 1 or changing this bond angle theta or changing simultaneously this bond angle r 1 or theta. Now, if I have a simple diatomic molecule like A B, I have only one nuclear uh, config, uh, co co coordinate uh, internal coordinate that is the bond distance. I can simply increase it or decrease it. So, the potential energy curve in this case will be one dimensional because I have only one this bond distance. But when I come to let us say water molecule for example, I can change r 1 while keeping r 2 theta constant or I can change r 2 while keeping r 1 theta constant or I can simultaneously change r 1 theta and r 2. So, therefore, my potential energy curve in this case would become at least uh, would become th three dimensional. So, that means, I can have three different dimensions along which I can change the nuclear co uh, uh, coordinate and solve the electronic part of the solution and obtain potential energy curves. So, the dimensionality of this potential energies are given by the number of nuclear degrees of freedom or vibrational degrees of freedom available to that molecule. For nonlinear molecules this is 3 n minus 6 where capital N is number of atoms in that molecule. So, this electron the potential energy surface is now a multidimensional surface. So, for example, if you take a molecule with uh, 10 atoms, so this will become th 3 into 10 30 minus 6 24. So, this potential energy surface is actually 24 dimensional. So, but we cannot of course, visualize potential uh, anything with, with that high dimension. So, we can take slices of potential energy surface this uh, with very high dimension. We can take a few slices of this potential energy surface and then we can uh, visualize them. So, this is about the when we have the overall solution for the molecular Hamiltonian. But now, the point is how can we solve this electronic part of the uh, problem. So, we said that okay, we can invoke von Oppenheimer approximation ignore the nuclear uh, uh, motion, but even when we have only electronic part of the solution there is a problem. What is that? See we can solve we have seen that we could solve many problems where there was one particle or one electron, but as long as this system is like this which has only one electron operator we are able to solve the problem. 
In fact, you can see the way I have written down this one electron part, you can see that this is a sum of many one electron part. So, each electron and its uh, potential energy with all other nuclei. So, this term together represent one effective Hamiltonian for that particular electron. So, I have many such electrons. So, therefore, this summation sign. So, these terms are one electron operators, but these terms what we see the two electronic terms they create trouble. I, ha I cannot solve this problem exactly when I have these two electron terms are out there in my uh, problem. So, whenever I have these two electronic uh, operators I cannot solve the problem exactly and then I would look for an approximate method of solution. This is what we are going to uh, discuss that we will now talk about some approximate methods and how we can go about them. The first one that you discuss is known as variational principle. To tell to remind you, so now we have a problem, we have a Hamiltonian which is very complex that means it has got two electronic operators. Suppose we know the solution of this uh, problem. Uh, of course, the point is we do not know, so, but suppose we know the exact solution and we call that ground state of that uh, solution the for lowest eigen function as psi 0 and corresponding energy is E 0 psi 0. So, this would have been the solution that we would love to have, but the problem is that our Hamiltonian is so complex that I do not know psi 0 nor do I know E 0 exactly. So, this is the problem. So, how do I get psi 0 and E 0 uh, for, for this problem, where psi 0 is the ground state wave function or Eigen function, E 0 is the ground state energy. Of a Hamiltonian which has a complex term, uh, op uh, operators that, uh, that complicated operators that we do not know how to solve them exactly. Now, when we do not know this solution exactly, let us say that I take a trial function. Suppose I say okay, I do not know psi 0, but I have some feeling because I know the system, I have some feeling that let the, let the phi which is another function be a trial function. So, we call this phi as a trial function. When I define this psi, uh, phi as a trial function, I can of course, correspondingly uh, write down uh, an energy expectation value uh, for this corresponding to this trial function, which will be given by If you remember, we introduced the bracket notation just to uh, clarify, we have this phi, phi star, the Hamiltonian phi over all space and the term here phi star phi is making sure in case I have not normalized this phi, I can use, use this term over here so that I make sure that the phi is, is normalized. So, this is the energy I call this E phi coming out when I am considering a trial function phi, I of course, know that this is perhaps not the, the solution because I do not know the exact solution, I am living with this phi. For example, what kind of phi would I take? So, I will see the system in hand and then may I will make an intelligent guess because I would perhaps break down the system into smaller part and I will see that okay, this system has this simpler part, this complex part, maybe this kind of trial function will be sufficient. So, I will we'll come back to a few examples where I will show you how we can uh, uh, take these trial functions, but let us look at uh, this, this term here. So, I for a given trial function, I can always obtain this energy corresponding energy. So, remember this, this is doable even with when the Hamiltonian has two, uh, two electron terms, the evaluating this integral we can either use uh, advanced uh, mathematical techniques or even computational method uh, using computers we can evaluate these integrals. For, therefore, for a given value of phi we can compute or we can evaluate a value of E phi, but then what? What variational principle tells me is that whatever value of E phi that you get this is always going to be greater than 
or equal to E0. This is what the variational principle tells me that if you do not know the exact solutions I0 and E0, you can try with a trial function phi and evaluate this energy corresponding to that phi and this E phi, the energy when you have this trial function, this energy is going to be always greater than E0 or the true energy or the exact ground state energy. Why does it, how does it uh, uh, tell uh, that this relation holds? We can see that the psi 0, of course, we do not know, but if you knew that we would know that psi 0 will be the lowest eigenfunction of this Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator. So, if I have psi 0, I have psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, so on and so forth, number of eigenfunctions because it is a Hermitian operator and psi i is the eigenfunction of this Hermitian operator will form a complete set of orthonormal eigenfunctions. So, this I know because Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator. So, I know this psi i is form a complete set. So, if psi i is form a complete set, no matter what trial function I am taking as long as it follows the same uh, boundary condition, this trial function is now an arbitrary function phi which I know I can express as a linear combination of this psi i's because they form a complete set. Since they form a complete set, I can explain express any arbitrary function as a linear combination of them. And when I do this, I would know from uh, the discussion that we had in uh, some classes uh, earlier classes, the expectation value or the average value corresponding to the energy which will be uh, essentially this term E would actually be uh, C i square E i uh, such such a term. So, if I expand it, so I will have C 0 square E 0 plus C 1 square E 1 what is E 0? E 0 is the ground state energy, E 1 is the first excited state energy and so on and so forth. What are C 0, C 1 square? C 0 square is the contribution uh, the coefficient corresponding to psi 0. So, C 0 square is actually the overall contribution of the ground state energy to this average value of energy. Now, let us see a condition a situation where the wave function the arbitrary wave function arbitrary function phi is linear instead of being a linear combination is actually only equal to psi 0. So, if it is only equal to psi 0 that means, C 0 is 1 and C 1, C 2, C 3 all other terms become 0. So, in that case what happens to the average energy? The average energy becomes C 0 which is 1, 1 square multiplied by E 0. So, the average energy becomes nothing but E 0. What is E 0? E 0 is the ground state energy. So, that means, if in the limiting case when the trial wave function is simply psi 0, then my energy is E 0. Now, of all other cases where my trial function has some contribution of other eigenfunctions I like psi 1, psi 2, psi 3 so on so forth. So, in that case what happens? Let us consider an example where my phi the trial function happens to be 80 percent contribution from the ground state E 0. So, this is 0 0.8 E 0 and 20 percent contribution from the first excited state. So, my average energy becomes 0 0.8 E 1 E 0 plus 0.2 E 1, but I know E 1 has higher energy than E 0. So, therefore, this term will always be greater than E 0. When will it be E equal to E 0? It will be equal to E 0 when the coefficient over E 0 becomes 1 and the coefficient over for E 1 becomes a 0. So, in that case, we, we found that for any arbitrary function phi, the energy that we are getting will be greater than the ground state energy and on only that case where phi is equal to psi 0, in that case this equality will hold. So, what the, in other words what happens is that we are telling that when E phi will most in most of the times it will be greater than E 0, but when it approaches E 0 and this can happen only when phi approaches psi 0. So, this is my trial wave function 
and this is the true wave function. So now I have from variational principle I have a recipe that suppose this is my true energy exact energy that I still do not know. But now variational principle tells me do not worry you make a guess you make a trial function and evaluate this E phi from your trial function. Now you see that E phi is always going to be greater than E0. So, this will be always above E0. E, uh, e now, how would I come from E phi to E0? I will go from phi to psi 0, I can get the true exact wave function when I can if I can bring this E phi as low as I can. So, that means I can make this E phi as minimum uh, as low as I can. So, in other words I can minimize this E phi function. I can if I minimize this E phi function the whatever is the lowest possible value of E phi that would be the best explanation uh, of the ground state energy given the trial function that I have chosen. Now, how do I do that? So, if I want to minimize a function I should have a I can have a variable inside that function I can and then I take can take first derivative of this function with respect to that variable and try to make it 0. So, for example, uh, let us consider uh, a case where we call this phi, we will have this trial function phi, but we will have a provision that let this phi be phi of alpha. When this phi has that means this phi depends on a parameter alpha. So, for given this uh, phi as phi of alpha my E phi becomes E phi the energy as a function of alpha. So, now I can minimize this E phi with respect to alpha and then find out what is the value of alpha and I call this alpha as alpha minimum. Now, this value of alpha minimum is the best case scenario given the trial function I have. Now, I plug this alpha minimum into this uh, phi. So, therefore, I have a phi of alpha minimum and when I use this phi of alpha minimum into this integral I get my E phi minimum and this is the best explanation for the trial uh, uh, for best explanation of the ground state wave function given the choice I made with the trial function. So, of course, we, we see that if our choice is good if our starting uh, trial function is, is a good function we can come to uh, E 0 very close uh, we can come to uh, come very close to E 0, but if our trial function is not good no matter what how much minimization we do we simply cannot come very close to the true wave function. So, this is overall the recipe uh, or the principle how we can calculate the variation uh, use variational principle to get an approximate solution to a system where the exact solution is not known. In uh, next class we will take some examples where we can use this variational principle and discuss how we can solve this problem approximately. Thank you for your attention.